Okay. So welcome to the last official class meeting. Uh, so again, on Friday, uh, it's not a C++ class, it's just me talking a bit about various things, and so you're welcome to skip out on Friday. Uh, nice to see the few in the crowd still here this semester, somewhat less than the 70 enrolled. <laughs> You watch, they'll come out of the woodwork come finals. Um, so yeah, so this is it. This last one, yeah, what? what? Kind of things are you, are you gonna discuss on, on Friday? Uh, so my, my official spiel is I'll talk about everything from the Cold War to the price of cars. And it's not what you think. It, well, it is what you think. It's not. It, it's various, various and sundry. Uh, some of it has to do with computers. None of it has to do with C++. Are you going to tell us what that secret is? Yeah, I'll tell you what that patch is, sure. Your secret identity and what you really Nice secret. We will, un we will really unmask the bat Todd. What you really bat That's right. I, I just, I just <laughs> kind of, this is just that this whole lonely loser is a facade. That's not the real me. <laughs> All right. Uh, All the above. So this is your opportunity to ask me C++ questions and final questions and so forth. Yes. Terminology. Okay, so the, the issue is that uh, while you feel like you're gaining some proficiency in the actual doing of the stuff, there's uh, the vocabulary is slow to catch up, and so it makes it hard to ask questions generally and, and also to interact with your peers and say I'm having a problem with it and all you're left with is pointing at the screen and saying this thing. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I'll, I'll do it for just a little bit. I, um, I, it, it's hard for me to do it comprehensively, right? So I, I'll, I guess I can speak a little bit to some of the terms in the project we're doing now and try and think back maybe to project two a little bit, but uh, then I'll throw it back to you and say, okay, what am I missing that you want me to be sure and, and talk about? So, uh, first is the class. So let, let's call this uh, glossary maybe. A class is it's just an encapsulation of data with with the operations that manipulate the data. Encapsulate. To encapsulate means to bind together into the same capsule to encompass. So let me give you the the counter example to a class would be uh, here is a C style. Um, 
let me, uh, I'll, just for trivia's sake, I'm going to make all these lowercase. Okay, this is uh, the counter example to me talking about encapsulation. So again, encapsulation is the bundling together of data and the operations that interact with or manipulate that data. And here I'm providing a structure, that, and again, struct is something comes, that comes from the C language, and which incidentally you do have in C++ as well. Uh, and all a struct is, is it is a grouping together of data. And, and for this example, I didn't even have to do that. I could have just had one integer called month. Okay, so I, I'm just making it a little more complex unnecessarily. Uh, here's a function, which is add a day. And what you do is you give it a date, and it adds a, a, a day to the day variable of a, of a date. And then it, it returns back that modified date. Here's main. I create a date dt, which should be lowercase. I call this add a day function, I give it dt, and then the modified date I then reassign to my original dt variable. And then here I am, I'm, I'm increasing the day by five. Uh, so this is not encapsulation in that I have not, even though I have a function called add a day that does work with dates, that function is in no way bound to this date structure. Uh, and in, in the, there's a, a concept of um, visibility here, which is that the function on line 7 through 11, uh, in principle, has a, vi a global visibility. I can use that function absolutely anywhere. And, and as, as long as I have a, some sort of date to throw in it, it's fine. Uh, also note that the, the data I'm able, to, maybe I'll do this, the data like on line 17, I'm a, actually able to manipulate, interact with that data independent of any sort of function, right? Just at a whim. Basically that data, any data for any date I create, I can manipulate wherever I want. And so the, the philosophy, this, adds 5 to the month, to DT's month. And I, I'm just showing that, I, that, that that data, there's no con, here there's no concept of public and private, or I should say the only thing is public, so I, I'm able to access it from anywhere. Um, and, and what, what, historically has happened if you weren't really disciplined is you would tend to take groups of data like this date that has a day month and year uh, maybe it wouldn't even be in a structure maybe you're just holding it as three independent variables somewhere and you end up shipping this data all around your application you're manipulating it all around your application so if you have a million lines of code You've got a million, well, potentially a million places, let's say one-tenth of the time, 100,000 of those lines is somehow manipulating this day, month, and year, okay? And this is a maintenance nightmare because you have some code way off in the boondocks of your application that's modifying the month by adding five to it, and you weren't expecting that modification in some other part of your code. Okay, and so generally this, this kind of loosey-goosey treatment of data and, and being able to manipulate it wherever you want does create maintenance problems as your application grows and changes and so on and so forth. So the, the idea of encapsulation is, hey, let's not do it this way where you're able to modify that data wherever. Let's create, let's decide what those functions are that actually do need to manipulate this day, month, and year and kind of slam it together with the day, month, and year. Now I can use my date and my million lines of code, but the only places it's going to be modified are in those few functions I defined for this date class. Right? So regardless of how big my application gets, it's only those member functions where the day, month, and year could actually change. So that's the principle behind 
why encapsulation is seen as being valuable. You localize those uh, operations that are going to be changing your data and you're not allowing those operations to occur anywhere in your application. Okay. And that, that principle extends beyond C++. This is just generally what is referred to as an object-oriented uh, programming paradigm, I guess. And um, yes, so that's the class. Now we get to C++ specifically, and we have a class declaration. This is described declaration. This is describing, um, I've always referred to it as the blueprint. of a class, meaning a blueprint of a class, a blueprint that is a blueprint of the encapsulation. And you also have a class definition, uh, which is describing the algorithm that each operation uh, undertakes a so meaning meaning so when I say that each operate let me see describes the uh, code that each operation member function All right so when I have a class now if I have a, a date class class date and I've got my private, and I got my integer, day, month, year, and then I have something like in public, I have void, display, as a general rule. Now there are always exceptions. And there are times where you will have data that's public, and there are times where you will have functions that are private. But as a generalization, it's a true statement that your private, your data is private, and your functions are public. So, when I, as I read, uh, as I reread this class, this glossary entry for class definition, it says describing the algorithm, the code that that is all the C out statements that you're going to write for each operation that is the display member function. Right? So the display is an operation that occurs on the day, month, and year. So I'm trying I'm trying a little bit to use generic language that isn't necessarily specific to C++. Uh, not every object-oriented programming language has both a declaration and a definition. Uh, Java, for example, the definition of the functions actually occur in line in the definition. So in Java, I would have my curly braces right here. And it also handles output differently. But this is how it would look like in Java. So there, it would all be bunched in one place. So it, it's different in Java. Uh, same kind of deal in Python. So this idea of breaking out the operations, or as I would call them, the member functions separately is uh, predominantly a C++ phenomenon. So a, a, so a function, um, I can't describe it, but I know it when I see it. All right. Can, can we all agree what a function is? Analogous to a mathematical function, it, it has a name, it takes inputs, it does something, and it has an, uh, an output. It takes inputs, has an output. Um, a member function, and, and I started off by saying when I was looking at this, I said that this function is, is, has a global scope or a global visibility. That means in my million lines of code, I can call the add a day function wherever I want. Now that is different for C++, and C++ introduces this thing. This is called a scope 
resolution operator. And in fact, in C and it, it is a C++ uh, operator. It doesn't exist in the C language. In fact, a function like add a day, you can do this. In C++, that essentially is the same thing. That's saying that this is a normal function that is globally accessible, globally viewable. In, in C, you would do this because there's no concept of scoping out functions. All functions were, are globally accessible. Uh, but putting the, the two colons here is, uh, again, it, it mean, in C++ means the same thing. It is still a function that is globally accessible, meaning that I don't have anything sitting right there to this side of the, the double colons. However, if I put something to the left of the double colons and I say date colon colon add a day, now this function is a member function. And it is saying that add a day is a member of the date class. And so people get confused with, for instance, uh, destructors is a place where people get confused. So if I was to write a destructor for this date class, the destructor is always a tilde followed by the name of the class. And again, this is a function that automatically gets called whenever a date object dies or goes out of scope. Uh, but when you get to the definition, it is, well, how do I write that function? How do I actually write the algorithm for that function? And people get confused about, well, is it this or is it this? And once you understand the purpose of the scope resolution function, and keeping your, what I do is keep in your head this example, that, that having two colons before the name of the function, uh, the, the way I have it written here just shows that this is a function, a globally accessible function. So the only thing that you can do is say that it's not global and it's only recognized in a particular context. So in that case, looking at this, then it's always the scope that it's recognized in followed by the name of the function. So this one would be incorrect. The, the name of the class that the function belongs to, and then the name of the function. Okay. Date colon colon display. Display is a function that's part of the date class. So I'd call these member functions. Now, one of the one of the terminology faux pas that uh, I've heard many of you using is that um, that, uh, let me see if I can think of an example. Um, it, you're mixing up file terminology and class terminology. So rather than say, calling it a class declaration, you say, oh, that's the date.h file or that's the header, or, or, or something like that, okay? And you have to keep in mind that the idea of separate of files generally is an operating system concept. It's not a C++ concept. And so the whole deal with files is completely independent of the code. That million line application, you can have in a single file, all right? So the reason why we, and I'm not going to rebroach that entire discussion, but the reason we break things into different files is it is much more efficient. It allows multiple people to work on a large project at the same time, and we also get a lot of efficiencies in building a project. And when we make one change to our million line application, we don't want to recompile a million lines of code because it takes a good depending on the processor, it wouldn't be unusual for that build to take all afternoon. And you don't want to find that, you, you all have been debugging, how many times have you all compiled Project 3 or Project 4 to get it running? 
Is it more than 20 times? Imagine spending a whole afternoon waiting for it each time you make a change to see if that change worked. So having separate files allows us to modularize components of the application so that if we change this part of the application, we only need to recompile this part of the application and then link together everything that was recompiled previously. Okay, and so that's why we have separate files. And the breakdown that works very nice for our purposes in C++ is to put the class declaration in a header file and the class definition in a source file, in a CPP file. All right. Uh, I my glossary looks quite messy like everything I seem to do up here, but oh well. An operator. An operator is plus, minus, divided by, multiply, this funny arrow thing, this thing, uh, a function call, meaning not func, but uh, I need, I need, how do I, a v. There we go. That thing. Those parentheses, that's an operator. Um, what else are operators? Uh, that's an operator. That's an operator. <coughs> yep. Ampersand is an operator. Uh, any we've been using that I'm missing? Yes, exclamation point. That's an operator. S say it again. Yeah, or, and. Uh, there's also some we haven't been dealing with. That's also that's a bitwise and that's a bitwise or. Um, hmm. Yeah, yeah. So these are a couple of your your boolean operators. Or I guess those are bitwise operators. But yeah. Re yeah, the relational operators. Okay. Uh, more operator, there are a lot more operators than we've gotten this semester, and you'll be learning um, additional operators as you continue on in your, your journey here. Uh, part of the confusing thing is that some of these operators are reused, so we know that the asterisk is not only multiplication, but it's also used as a noun to describe a kind of thing like a float pointer. And it's also used as a verb, as in dereferencing a pointer. Uh, so you see the asterisk three times in this table here. Here's the dereferencing version of it. Here's the multiplication version of it. And you won't see the, uh, the third use. The third use isn't an operator use. Uh, when you do something like float pointer FP, that's not an operator there. This is describing a type, this FLOAT. Asterisk is describing a type, so that's not an operator. So when I gave you the one of the things that was important for me to, and it's still important for, uh, in my opinion, for you to know, is that even if you don't understand all of these, um, you should be able to rank them based on this table, right? If I go, if I do that, then the question is, where do I put the parentheses? It's either going to be this, <coughs> or it's going to be Uh, let's see, how do I have to do this? A, arrow B, like this. So this, assi this particular problem on the midterm, I was asking you to put parentheses where the, uh, that correctly represents the order of operations. I wasn't asking you to change anything. I was asking you to use parentheses to show me how these things naturally group in the same sense that if I say, a plus B times C, we all know that multiplication happens before addition, so naturally, the natural way this precedence is going to fall out is like this. The multiplication happens first, the addition happens second. 
That's what I was asking for on that midterm problem. And you should be able to look at a, a long line of crap here with all these symbols. And by looking at this, you should be able to rank them and then group the parentheses. And so doing it for this one, we have the dereferencing and the little arrow. So the dereferencing is 3, and the arrow is 2. So the arrow should be happening first. So this would be the right one. The arrow happens first, and the dereferencing ha happens second. Okay, it's 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 going to be a a huge advantage to you in the long run as you begin to understand this as a language of expressions and an evaluation of expressions, and that at every point you can look at how much of it's been evaluated and what it is at that point of evaluation. So if I say float pointer. FP, what kind of thing is FP? You should say a float pointer. What kind of thing is this? That's a float. In fact, I don't even need the, the semicolon. I just ask, what kind of thing is that expression evaluating to? So when you say C out, blah, what kind of thing is this bit? I'd say that's a character pointer. Yeah, that's not a best good example. We need to do 3.14. What kind of thing is that? That's a float. What kind of thing is this whole expression? This whole expression is an O stream, an output stream. How do I know that? Because we've had discussions previously where we know that the only way that this can work is to know that C out less than less than 3.14 has to happen first. This is an expression that gets evaluated in the same sense that this is an expression that gets evaluated. After it evaluates, well, let me ask the question of this. What kind of thing is the result of this expression, 3 plus 4? An int, right? We don't, it isn't necessary, doesn't, isn't important that it's a 7, it's that it's an integer. What kind of thing is the result of this expression? And the answer is an O stream. What, what, what's an example of an O stream? C out. In fact, that's what it is. If you do C out less than less than 3.14, when you're done doing that, the result of the expression is C out. Why is that important? Because you're going to need it to be C out for when you hit this part of the expression. right? And then when that's done doing its thing, that whole thing should be C out so that you can do this part of the expression. And that's why you can chain this thing as long as you want is that it's evaluated from left to right. So 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 is it evaluates the 3 plus 4, and then it gives us something back. And then whatever it gives us back, that's what we do with the plus 5. And whatever that gives us back, that's what we do with the plus 6. So C out less and less than 3.14. It does some stuff, and then it gives us back C out. And then we can do it with the 3. And then it gives us back C out, and we can do it with the 4. Exact same principle. Okay. So I, I, I'm with you that it's a little bit confusing, but keep in the back of your head that the language is just an evaluation of expressions. And whenever you get confused about what that means, write 3 plus 4 times 5 and, and ask yourself what is happening one step after another. Evaluation gives me something back. Evaluation gives me something back. Yes? I just had a quick question about integers. If you give like an integer like 3.14, it'll just round out to that's an excellent question. So if you if you take uh, an integer like three and you add three point one four, what happens? There's something called um, implicit. You know, I don't have the term right. It's a promotion of type. And what'll happen is if you have a simple type with a more complex type, the simple type gets promoted to the more complex type. So in this case, uh, the three gets converted to a three point zero, and you end up with uh, six point one four. So that promotion will occur. Uh, where we didn't see it is uh, it, was, it was with this, right? We didn't get uh, one and a third. We got one, and it just truncated. But that's because they're both integers. Interestingly enough, if you do this, exact same phenomena happens. The 4 gets promoted to 4.0, and we end up with 1.33333. If I say int x equals 3.14, then what happens is uh, 
x has 3. So when I talk about one thing to keep in mind with this promotion is that it's not mutating anything. It isn't changing anything. Whatever's there is still there. It's basically creating a temporary value. So if I do this, if I say, uh, I'm going to get rid of some of this stuff. If I say integer x equals 3, and then I want to do uh, float a equals x divided by 4.0, then a is going to the x gets promoted to 3.0 and a equals 0.75. Okay, x did not change. If I then come here and I do c out on x, we get 3 printing out. It doesn't mutate x. All it is doing is it's taking a copy of x and it, it's promoting that copy, and the 4.0 is being operated on with that copy that's been promoted. And it's it's a temporary. That temporary, as soon as I go to the next line of code, that temporary is gone, right? It's just like the computer thinking in its head so that it can do the arithmetic and then whatever it was using goes away. Uh, let's see. So looking at my glossary here, is there anything else I want to throw out right now? Um, member function, he header file, source file, declaration, definition. Uh Parameter versus argument, and this is that's a good one. Parameter versus argument, and this is one that I'm terrible at personally. For whatever reason, I never learned with parameter in my head, so it is only with great difficulty that I use that multi-syllable word. I'm, I'm calling everything an argument, but the official right way is that. x is the parameter to this function. Three is the argument being passed to the call to this function. And lest you think that it has to be a hard-coded number, if I say integer y here, then y is the argument. So when you're using it as a verb, it's an argument. I'm passing arguments to this function when I call it. If I'm merely describing what the function is, and this, this could have code here. Here, this is, I guess what I should do is take this comment and put it there. In the definition of the function, I refer to them as parameters. And if you go back and listen to my screencasts, don't do that. Uh, you're going to find that I, I probably nine times out of ten say argument when I should be saying parameter. And, and I'm sorry, just to interrupt you just for a moment, if you haven't looked, uh, I found out that actually Teddy, my former TA, has been watching my screencasts, and he said, oh, you couldn't find that other final? Here it is. So I did post the second final that I had. Um, so thank you, Teddy. I'm sure you're listening to this five hours from now. Um, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. You, you, you mentioned new. New is an operator, by the way. Yeah. I know what it does, but I can't explain it, and that's what you have to do on the final. Um, and so when I was looking at reference, you know, the reference on it, I'm just like, oh, God, what do I say? And I don't really know what parts of it. Well, tell it, tell it to me, and I don't know what to say speak. What, is, what does new do? It creates something, yeah, that's accurate. It has to do with the constructor. It has to do with the constructor. The answer to that's maybe. And it creates it creates something new in like the class or something like that. All right. So <laughs> Uh, our, it, it's a matter. So you, I think the key term that you're getting accurate is create. Okay. We create things in C plus plus by other. Um, 
doing something like int x or knight k1. These are all statements that are creating things. And it becomes uh, the difference between this and new is a matter of timing. I would call these static declarations. Static means compile time. Is it creating a new, is it creating a uh, So, uh, uh, let me get to that. Uh, so, the static means that you know at the time that you're compiling the program that, that one integer is going to be created here and one night is going to be created here, right? The, and the problem that we have with static declarations is we have no flexibility. The... Uh, there are a lot of situations where we don't have the slightest idea of whether we need an integer or a knight until the program is running. A great example is this: these projects three and four that you're doing. Your employees are in an employee.txt file. Now, when the graders test your program, they should be able to create an employee.txt file with 50 employees in it, and your program should work just fine, right? Because your program should be deciding while the program is running how many employees are needed. And that that uh, ability for you to make to, for you to create something while the program is running is called new, the new operator, and and it'll create a new whatever you say. So if I say new night, it'll create a night. If I say new integer, it'll create an integer. If I say new 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 int five, it'll create five integers. What would the name of that be if you just typed in like new night? Yeah. What would the name of it be? It has no name. Let me emphasize that. Picture. So why would you use new instead of declaring, like for example, the night where you can say night one, night two, night three? Why would so why would I do the line that my cursor is on as opposed to just saying night one, night two, night three like I did in the declaration above? And the answer is I do not know. It's an incomplete example obviously, but let me change project three, which is project three is now a joust game where you have to create as many nights as there are in the file. So you don't know. And you don't know. It's it, so you do like assign like the name of it later to like the whatever the knight's name is. So uh, the so the naming. Let me bring up. Now where am I actually creating this? Yeah, all right, hang on. I have to move glossary.txt and uh, I have to move glossary.txt and struct.cpp and to 2014.05.07. This has to go here. And we want to call this using new. Okay. When I when I do line 31, then what it's doing is it's finding some memory that's available and it's setting aside enough room for the name and enough room for that night's stamina. And then every knight has a weapon in hand, right? So now it's setting, ooh, it's probably setting aside this much memory for weapon in hand. 
and weapon in hand has a type and it has a stamina required and it has a hit chance. So all and then all these three are all part of weapon in hand. Knight also has on horse. <clears throat> uh, yeah, knight also has on horse. So we'll just say on horse there. We'll just squeeze that in there. Um, so that's what this does, and it's labeled K1. <clears throat> when you do new knight, it's doing something similar. So I have, to, I have to do all the exact th same things. I want to just write same here. All this stuff looks the same in here. However, there's no name attached to it. The only thing that is known about this is that it's at location 112, and that is what new gives back. So line 13 or 33 is written as fine, assuming that you had a default constructor. Let me do this. You pass in five variables. Line 33 is fine, but line 33 is tragic in that I am going to allocate this memory here. I'm going to give back the 112, and it's going to go into the ether. And I'll, I, don't have, I don't grab it, so it's gone forever. Now, just to make clear that there's no problem with that syntactically, I, that is num, line 33 is a perfectly legal st statement in the language. I add 5 to 4, it gives me back a 9, and I do absolutely nothing with that 9. It is lost forever. I go to line 34. Okay, the Line 34 creates that big thing in the light gray color. It gives me the 112 back, and I do nothing with it, and I go to line 35, and so on and so forth. If you want to grab it, you have to create a variable for it. So let's create a night pointer, and we'll call that Kippy. And Kippy will be equal to to 118, essentially. But how, how would that work in, in an infinite iteration where you just like have a file and you're just reading in unknown sources? How could you name them all? Would you? Well, you did so. So if you have, but here's the thing: is you don't. You, you're doing this right now in project three. How do you name them? Is you aren't naming them. You're creating it, and then what are you doing? You're pushing it somewhere to store it and access it later. You haven't named your five in the sense of variables. You haven't named your five employees or three employees or whatever it is. You create the employee and you push it on a vector. You create the employee and push it on a vector. And when you, then you when you need to do something with the employees, you iterate through that vector. And you don't say I want. Bob and Boss Hog and whatever their names are, you say, I want the first employee and the second employee in that vector and the third employee in that vector, right? Now you're just dealing with pointers. They're pointing to things that have meaning for you. In that, in this, uh, projects three and four are key for you to get a feel for what your programming life will be like is you're constantly creating things dynamically at runtime and you're shoving them into structures. Big parts of uh, 2.11 and 3.11 are the study of data structures. So this becomes interesting, the fact that we create all this stuff while the program is running. What do you do with it all? There's a whole science. There's a big field there of different ways of structuring this information. I've talked a little bit about vector. That's, that's the easiest one to understand. You've got You've got lists, doubly linked lists. You've got trees, binary trees, ter ternary trees. Uh, you've got graphs, all different kinds of ways of, of structuring and, and maintaining data. And then it becomes, a lot of your learning becomes, one, what do these different structures do? And two, how do you make the decision which structure is right for your situation? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, this whole thing's been kind of framed around this glossary thing and, and me jumping off in different directions. Does anyone have any generic questions or a particular glossary issue you want to ask me about? Huh? Yeah, so, yeah, so that's a good one to add to the, the gloss. Is this my glossary? Oh. <laughs> Boy, let me let me find a previous entry up here somewhere. Parameter versus argument. I just shove it in here. Uh, class 
versus object. Class is the blueprint. Object is an instance of that blueprint. The the uh, you know the the development out there. One of the developments out there at Eaton and Esplanade is a whole bunch of instances of some housing blueprint. So, uh, instance or object versus class. Number six, yeah. the, um, Number six of the final exam. Yes. Just put the new one. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Given the statement string pointer airplane array, uh, it's an array uh, point line one elements. We have we have a couple minutes, so I can actually bring it up. Uh, is it spring or fall? It's the fall. I believe. Number six. <clears throat> Given the statement string pointer airplane sub 25 describe what is created when this statement is executed be explicit in your answer I, this is a good question hats off to Teddy for this one uh, how many let's start with the easy part how many of them are created 25 so what I'm going to do is if I was to visualize this I'm just going to write over my diagram and just use it ignore all the stuff I've written I'll do this in red so I, I'm going to say that da, 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 I've got I've got 25 of these. This is statically created, so it actually has a label with it. Note the absence of the word new. So it's created at compile time, and so it's called airplane. So I'd label pictorially. I'd label the beginning of this airplane. I'd have 25 of these. Now the question is, I have 25 of what? What is each one of these? Let me ask a different. Let me ask a different question. Always the way to the way to best understand this stuff is always try to do it with a different example. Take something that you understand. Give me a type that you know rock solid. Yeah, int. Int. Yeah, int. How do you create twenty? How do you create one int? Int airplane. How do I create twenty five integers? So that is twenty five what? If that's 25 integers, then this is 25, 25 string pointers. What is a pointer? A pointer was like 118. It's just a number, right? They're just 25 addresses, 25 integers. They're under the hood. They're integers, essentially. But they're just 25 numbers. They're, they're expected to hold 25 addresses of strings. And that's why you can have new information. Yeah, so yeah, I might do this if I if I was going to use, uh, you know, who knows? You need to know the context. Uh, but yeah, it wouldn't be unusual to have some loop and be using new to create 25 strings for this array. This array would be pointing at 25 strings that were created. All right. This brings us to the end of our journey. Again, I want to emphasize that no one's required to come on Friday. I am on the piazza. Um, also, I, I've been really chastising my graders hard. I've been promised that they're going to work their butts off before Wednesday. Uh, so we'll, we'll see about that. I have a little bit of grading myself from a few people who had submitted something late that I accepted. I'm going to try and get to those today. Um, uh, what else, what else, what else? The, we need the word of the day, and then I promised, I promised the 1970s show. Is this... This might, I think it may, it's a good question. I don't remember. It may be late 70s, early 80s. I'm a little bit vague, okay? This is, this is, this is, this is, this is oh, this is good stuff right here. Uh, this is Land of the Lost. Now, the Land of the Lost was remade, I think, in the knots in the early 2000s. Not that Land of the Lost. You need to find, like, the, the uh, 1970s, early, I mean, it's probably 70s, 70s version of Land of the Lost, all right? On the left there, you got the Slee stack. You get, it's, the, it's hard to see, but that there, they've got these little bows that shoot crochet needles. And so these people are always running, and just off camera, you know there are people throwing knitting needles. 
that are kind of flopping everywhere. It, it's it's oh, you just got to see a few episodes. I mean, YouTube is your friend in these situations. The word of the day. The last word of the day. Oh, I already did that one. Uh, did I already do that one? No, that's today, Wednesday. Let me. It always pages wrong in this big. All right, there we go. Gauntlet. This was one of the first multiplayer arcade games, supported up to four players. Um, this was in 1985. This was so totally awesome. I got to tell you, it was good stuff. <clears throat> All right, we will see you. If not on Friday, we will see you on Wednesday.